I'm going to talk about the, the theories we're working on and where they're going and give you sort of a pretty depth, in-depth uh, review of what's happened and what's going to happen. And I gave a subtitle to this talk of Foundations for Machine Intelligence uh, because I think that's what we're working on. We're working on foundation technologies that will be applicable for many, many years in the future. And uh, we take a long-term view of that. So let's just get uh, right into it. At Nementa, we have uh, two basic missions, where uh, mission uh, things we're trying to accomplish. The first is to discover the operating principles of the neocortex. Our goal is not to understand a particular neocortex. We're not trying to recreate a human neocortex or a cat neocortex. Um, we're trying to understand the principles by which they all work. And our goal is not to produce humanoid-like robots. It's really to get at fundamental information processing principles that our brains use uh, and that make us intelligent. The second thing is we want to take that knowledge and turn it into technology that can be applied. And this is the practical side of this, so it's sort of a science side and a practical side. Now, it's, um, it's surprising, that, but not everyone thinks this is a good idea. And I mean by that not everyone thinks this is the right way to go to build intelligent machines or build intelligent technology. Um, so I want to just give you a little bit of motivation why we think understanding how the cortex works uh, is really important. And by the way, I should just point out the cortex if you're not familiar with it, it's about 75% of the volume of your brain. It's where all high-level thought occurs. And when I talk about the cortex, I'm actually talking about a few other structures with it, but I'm not going to get into that level of detail today. But we're talking about part of the brain, about three quarters of it. OK, so let's talk about why should we study brains to do this? Why should we study the neocortex to do this? Why will machine intelligence be based on cortical principles? Um, a couple of things you, you may not be aware of, but you might be if you uh, uh, follow this field much. Um, the cortex uses a very common algorithm for almost everything it does. So you think about vision and hearing and touches and, and behavior as very different types of things. But there's an unbelievable amount of evidence that says these are actually all manifestations of the same problem. And this was first pointed out 35 years ago. Uh, and, and it's kind of a hard thing to believe. It's one of those beautiful things. And so uh, we, we, it changes the way you think about the problem when you start thinking like, OK, you know, how, what, how are these things are common? But it's a, it's a common learning algorithm. And that suggests that we can understand that common learning algorithm. We can apply it to lots of different things. Now, it turns out that our brains, human brains, are particularly good at a lot of things. We're amazingly adaptable. We have languages. We have science. We have arts and engineering. All the things that we do, these are all a product of the neocortex. And we do not have separate areas or separate things to do these. It's still the same algorithm. So these core algorithms, which were originally evolved to understanding low-level sensory data and building a model of the world, can be applied to very, very deep problems that we deal with and what we think about as intelligence in our, in our species. And finally, this is not to say that the cortex always has the best solution to any particular problem. But it's extremely adaptable. And it's the most flexible solution. So we believe, in the end, what's really going to drive uh, the world and the technology towards a common set of uh, foundation principles for machine intelligence are network effects, things we've seen in the past in other areas. So people are going to want to work on the most flexible solutions, and we're going to, the most resources are going to be put into that. So we're going to be naturally moving towards a more universal solution. And there's nothing more universal than our brain. There's, we know nothing else that's even close to it. So these are the sort of motivations we use for studying the cortex and as, as an example for us. OK, here's my, uh, the agenda for my talk. I'm going to start with some cortical facts, uh, things we know about the brain. I'm going to then go into cortical theory, the a hierarchical temporal memory, the HDM theory. I'm going to give you a research roadmap, tell you what we've done, where we're going, what's next, what's after that. I'm going to give you an applications roadmap, what kind of things we can build today and in the future. And then I'll end with a few thoughts on machine intelligence. Now, as, uh, as Craig mentioned in the introduction, uh, some of this is going to get pretty deep. So it starts out easy, and it gets pretty deep, and then it gets easy again. Uh, as, as Craig mentioned, you don't really need to worry about it if um, you don't need to understand all the stuff that I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's, and, and, and you can sort of just try to, if it, if it gets a little hard, you can sort of pick up the pieces you can. Um, but the point is, is that it's, it's important to understand there's some depth to this. And, and when you hear this stuff, even if you're hearing it for the first time, you'll get a sense for what makes this technology unique and different than other things you might have thought about before. Uh, so it's kind of important to do that. It's a little bit like um, if you want to understand how a computer works, 
you know, if you want to use a computer, you don't really need to know all the details of what, you know, how cache memory works and stack pointers and all this kind of stuff. But someone had to know that initially. And we're going to get kind of that kind of level. You don't really need to understand all this to use this technology, but it's helpful to have this as a background. Okay, let's just jump right into it. Uh, so let's just start just a very high level view of what the cortex does. It's an organ of memory. It, it learns. Um, and it interfaces to the world through a bunch of sensory organs. So we, we all know about the retina and the cochlear and the somatic senses. There's quite a few sensory systems you have. And the interesting thing about it, though, is once you come outside of that, once you leave the retina or you leave the cochlea, it's just patterns of action potentials or firings on nerve fibers. And those nerve fibers are identical no matter which, what they represent. So there's no difference between a pattern that's coming in from the optic nerve there is from the somatic sensory uh, nerves. Um, and it's, the brain does not really deal with light and sound and touch. The brain, especially the cortex, basically deals with patterns. And the reason the world seems different, like vision seems different than hearing, is because of how the model that the brain makes from this. So the cortex is a, it takes in this fast changing sensory data. It's changing all the time. Think about my speech. It's changing on the order of milliseconds. It's flowing into your brain right now. And it builds a model of the world. Uh, it builds a predictive model, and that predictive model is basically says, I can constantly make predictions of what's going to happen next. It can detect when things are changed, unusual, and it can generate actions. Now, actions are, of course, your behavior. And it's interesting, when you think about the uh, behavior, most of the changes that are occurring on your sensory organs are coming from your own behavior, not from the world itself. For example, uh, most of the changes that are occurring on your eyes right now are because you're moving your eyes. And you're moving them several times a second. You're not aware of it. But it's constantly changing. You have a very fast changing data stream coming because you move your eyes. As you walk through a building, as you turn, as you touch things, it's all about how you interact with the world. So most of the changes that are coming are from your own sensory, of your own activity, your own behavior. So we say that the cortex builds or learns a sensory motor model of the world. It learns how the world behaves largely when we interact with it, but also how it behaves on its own. So this is what the goal of our system here is to build a sensory motor model of the world, and from that we can generate behaviors. OK, let's just jump into some real cortical facts. Here's a little picture of a neocortex. Uh, next to it, I show a rat neocortex, just to let you know that I'm talking about the same thing. It doesn't really matter what species we're talking about. If it's a mammal, it has a neocortex. And the properties I'm going to talk about now are universal across species. Um, the human neocortex and all neocortex is a thin sheet of cells. It's about 2.5 millimeters thick. Uh, it's, uh, it, I used to I always carry around a little a dinner napkin to give you a sense for what the, uh, it, this is a good model for human neocortex. It's about the right size and about the right thickness. And maybe somewhere around 60 billion neurons are in the sheet. And this is what's in your head and this is what's in my head right now. And this sheet of cells is listening in your head and mine is generating speech. Now what's interesting about it is it's remarkably uniform. Um, you can find differences here and there, but it's incredibly uniform, both anatomically, so you can look at different species in different areas of the neocortex, it looks virtually the same, and it's functionally uh, very, very um, uniform. I Meaning you can literally, and people have done this experiment, take an optic nerve and an auditory nerve and switch them on an animal, and the, and the part of the cortex that was auditory becomes op, you know, visual, and the visual becomes auditory. Um, if you delve down next level of structure, you'll see that it's organized as a hierarchy. Now, why is it organized as a hierarchy? Because even though it's a sheet of cells, different areas in the sheet connect to other areas. And if you follow that map, you get a hierarchy. And humans have a very deep and, and big hierarchy. Other mammals have a smaller one. Um, if you dive down next level, if you look at it's a slice of that two and a half millimeters, and you'll, the, first, the next structure you'll see is layers. There's layers of cells. Uh, how many layers depends on who's counting, but there's basically four layers of cells. Two, three is one, believe it or not, and then there's four, five, and six, four layers of cells. If you dive down further still, you'll see that there's neurons in there, and the neurons have a, an organizational property in these, something called mini columns. They're organized in these very mini, miniature columns. The mini columns exist. There's a debate within the neuroscience world whether they're functionally relevant. Uh, we believe they are, and I'm going to talk about them. If you delve down further still and you look at the neuron, here's a picture of the two types of neurons that exist in your cortex today, the two primary excitatory neurons. There's a pyramidal neuron on the left and a spiny stellate neuron on the right. They're actually very similar, except one doesn't have the big branch going up at the top. Now, these neurons have thousands of synapses on them, anywhere between three and 10,000 synapses on each synapses, connections on each cell. And what's interesting about it is that only a small percentage, about 10%, are close to the cell body. This is what most people think about when they think about a neuron. Most artificial neural networks, they think about these synapses that 
get summed in the cell body. But 90% of these synapses are far away. And, and for many years, people couldn't understand what they're there for. Because if you activate one of those distal synapses, um, it seems to have no effect at all. So people say, what are these thousands of synapses doing out here? We now know what's going on. You can jump down further, and we now know, this is something maybe in the last 15 years or so, it's become very clear, that if you look at one of these little branches on these dendrites, off near, not near the cell body, far away from the cell body, they're active processing elements. And if you have a set of synapses that become active relatively close period in time and relatively close in space, meaning they're near each other, it can generate what they call a, a dendritic action potential, which travels to the cell body and depolarizes the cell. It has a large effect on the cell. It doesn't make the cell fire, but it depolarizes it. So now we have all these thousands of synapses out there that are doing some sort of like coincidence detector. And then finally, people think that learning in the brain, we used to think, and many people still do, it's all about changing the synaptic weight, that is the strength of these connections. Well, that happens to some extent. We now know that synapses are formed new synapses are formed all the time and are being lost all the time. And this is a much more powerful type of learning. It's called synaptogenesis. And so it's not like, oh, I'm just incrementing a little weight here. I can form a completely new connection. And uh, this is really real, actually where most learning occurs in the brain. OK, so that's some cortical facts. Now, what's the theory behind this? Well, we have a, an overall theory for this. We call HTM, hierarchical temporal memory. It's, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It essentially says we have a hierarchy of identical regions, uh, meaning they're all doing something very similar. So that's pretty much fact. Um, they are learning something, so it's memory. And now, but the, here's the thing. We believe that all these regions are primarily memory of, of time-based patterns. It's memory of sequences or temporal transitions. And what, it's, like, it's like you're learning melodies in each one of these. And what happens is if you can make proper predictions, if it's a, it's a predictive model, predictive memory, if you can predict what's going to happen and you form a stable representation for it, and you end up with representations being more stable as you ascend the hierarchy. It's like you're learning names of sequences and then names of the sequences of the sequences and so on. And similarly, when you have a, a high-level stable representation, it can unfold uh, into very long complex speeches, sequences like my speech. Right? So I have some very high level concepts I'm thinking about, and then I'm just playing back memories that I've recorded earlier. I, I've said these words before, um, and I've said these ideas before, and I'm just playing back recorded sequences, and it turns out to be a very fast level pattern. OK, that's the basic idea of HTM. The question now we want to ask is, well, how does this exactly work in detail? Um, what do the regions do? What are the cellular layers are doing? How do the neurons work, et cetera? And this is what we spend most of our time studying. So let's just jump into it further. Here's a slice of that two and a half millimeters of cortex. And we can see the four layers there. There's roughly two feed forward layers and two feedback layers. So the two the layers two, three, and four are feed forward, and layers uh, five and six are feed back. And what we believe is each layer of cells is implementing a type of sequence memory. Each one is implementing actually a variation on the same type of sequence memory. The two feed forward layers are doing inference or pattern recognition, and I'm going to go into details about how those we believe those work. And the other ones are more of a feedback. Uh, layer five is the layer, the, the layer that has cells that generate motor behavior. So my speech is being generated by cells in layer five in parts of my cortex. And then layer six is it has to do with attention and hierarchy. Um, so those are the basic idea there. And we think, again, every one of these layers is doing something similar. But it's, doing, it's a variation, and it's being applied to different problems by what it's connected to. So you can take this sort of generic sequence memory and then turn it to different uses. Because you know, motor behavior is sequence memory, and inference is sequence memory, and so on. So let's just jump into uh, layers uh, four and two, three, the two feed forward inference layers. And these are the ones we understand the best. Um, a very classic neuroscience. If you uh, read any papers on neuroscience, you'll see this often, that the input to a particular region first arrives at layer four. This is the, the basic idea. And then it projects to layer three. And then layer three can, projects down to the next layer up the hierarchy. So this is, this is the, the basic feed forward pathway. It's, not, it's more complicated than this, but we can just leave it at this. Um, this is what you'll see in most textbooks. And so you go to layer four to layer three, then up to the next region, layer four to layer three. Now, everyone thinks about the input coming into the brain as being sensory data, like if the primary visual cortex or primary auditory cortex is information coming from the eyes or the ears. But there's another thing that's coming into area which people don't remember or they don't know, which is you get a copy of motor commands. So the cortex is not just sensing the world. It actually gets a copy of 
whoever else is making the behavior in the body. So my, whatever, you know, the parts of my spinal cord or my brain stem or, or lower pieces in the cortex, the behavior is actually passed in. So the, the cortex gets a copy of not only what is being sensed, but what the recent behaviors were that came from your body. What we think is going on in layer four is, um, is what we call uh, sensory motor inference. We learned sensory motor sequences. The best example, and I'll use a fair amount in this talk, is when you're looking at an image or you're looking at me. And as your eyes are moving, um, you constantly, completely change the input to your, to, to your brain, completely. It doesn't feel that way. The world feels stable to you. But every time your eye is moving, the entire innovation is different. And this is not a high order sequence. This is not a sequence that repeats itself. You can't predict uh, just by the order of what patterns come in what's going to be next. However, if you do have the copy of the motor command, you can do that. If you say, well, here's what I'm seeing. I'm about to move over here. I can predict what's going to happen next. And we believe that's what's going on in layer four. Um, this is a predictive memory. If the system can predict correctly what's going to occur next, we want to form a stable representation in the next layer, in this case, layer three. And if, if it can't, if it says, look, I'm not able to model this change, it passes those changes through. It says, look, I can't handle this. The next guy is going to get these changes. What layer three does is a, a, it's a, it's a more of a pure autosociative sequence memory. We call it a high order sequence memory. Um, and, uh, and a good example of what high order means is I just give you two, a very simple example here. Imagine I have two sequences, A, B, C, and D, and uh, X, B, C, and Y. And notice that if I want to show you, uh, after I train you on those sequences, if I show you A, B, C, you should predict D. And if I show you X, B, C, you should predict Y. Now, I can't just use the previous state. I can't just say, well, C, what should I predict? I can't tell you that. I have to go back in time. This makes it a high order sequence. And most of the world is like that. Language is like that. When you walk around a building is like this. Most of the world uh, manifests itself as high order sequences. So these are the two basic types of patterns you can, you can, you can see in the world. Um, these, are almost, these are like universal instant steps. If you think about it deeply, there isn't much else the brain can work on. It can say, look, I can try to make a predictive model based on my own behavior, or I can try to make a predictive model based on some sort of high order sequences I can observe. If I can't do that, then I can't do it. It's, it's, then it, it's like random. These are universally applied to every sensory modality. There are nothing specific about vision, hearing, or touch. Uh, it's a very, these are very uh, deep concepts. It also, if you know anything about neuroscience, I won't give you the evidence for this, but these steps completely explain the hyperreceptive field properties we see in layer four and layer three and layer two. Um, these concepts uh, lead to that. So we're pretty confident this is what's going on. Now we want to jump in further. I want to jump down to like exactly what's going on in one of these layers. And then when we get to the bottom of all that, then we'll come back up again. Um, so on the left is your biological neuron. This is a classic picture from Cajal back uh, 100 years ago. And um, on the right is our model, the HTM model neuron. And we have chosen to model certain parts of, of real neurons that we think are theoretically important. So let's just talk about the, the biological neuron. As I mentioned earlier, there is about 10% of the synapses are close to the cell body. Uh, these, these receive feed forward input. This is where the input that's like the sensory interval, the feed forward patterns come to. It adds linearly in the cell body, approximately, and this is what generates the spikes in the cells. The other two regions, what we call the basal dendrites in the bottom and the apical dendrites on the top, they connect, the, the ones at the bottom, these distal synapses, these connect to local connections nearby, other cells nearby in the same layer in the same region, and the ones at the top receive feedback in the hierarchy. As I mentioned earlier, these are nonlinear. They, are, they, they generate uh, dendritic action potentials, and they depolarize the cell. They don't make the cell fire. They just put the cell in a state that's ready to fire, and we, co we call that a predictive state. We model this basic arrangement. We have a set of uh, synapses on our model neurons that are feed forward, linear summation. We activate the cell. Um, and then we model the distal synapses as a set of coincidence detectors. Essentially, they say, if I see 10, 15, or 20 synapses active at the same time, Within on a dendritic segment, we will generate, uh, may put the cell in a predictive state. Uh, going one level further, we have to talk about learning. Um, biological synapses, these are the connections. You can see a little section of the dendrite here. You can actually see the synapses on there. Um, we now, as I mentioned earlier, think that learning is mostly about forming new synapses. And synapses themselves are very unreliable things. They're very low fide fidelity. They don't always work. Yeah, you know, they kind of, half the time they work, half the time they don't. 
And so anyone who has a model of a neuron or a model of a of cortex that relies on high precision, even one or two digits of precision, is not a biologically accurate model because their synapses aren't very good. The way we model this is different than most people do, is uh, we model the growth of a synapse. It's, like, it's, it's some, an idea called um, uh, potential synapses. You have an axon and a dendrite that are near each other, but they don't make a connection. And over training, you actually grow the spine, the connection between these two. This is well documented. And, um, uh, and it's that growth we model. So we give that a scalar value, a zero to one value. And when we train, we sort of increase that scale. And it's like growing the synapse. And at one point, at some point, it makes a connection to the, between the two. And there's a threshold for that. So that when, they, when the permanence hits some threshold, in this case 0.4, we say the synapse exists. And before that, it didn't exist. But we give it a, we give it a weight of 1 or 0. There's no scalar. It's just a binary weight. Then what's the point of having this? If you keep training it, what's the point of having the permanence go up higher? It makes it harder to forget. In a brain, what happens if you keep re repeating and training a real synapse, it gets thick. And it, it develops this bouton. And it's just much harder to forget it. Um, so we're trying to, we model that, that as opposed to the weight of it. OK. Now, one more detail, and then we can start showing how this whole thing works together. I'm going to talk about sparse distributed representations. Uh, Subutai is going to talk in much more detail about them later. He's going to give you some of the mathematical foundations. I'm just going to give you some of the concepts right now. I call this the language of intelligence. Uh, this, everything in the brain is all about sparse distributed representations. You can't understand how any of this stuff works. So I have to define what that is. And so we're going to do that. Um, pretty simply, it, it's, the simplest way to understand it is compared to the kind of representations we use in computers, which is called a dense representation. In a dense representation, you might have a byte or a word of some number of bits, and you use all combinations of ones and zeros. And um, an example being ASCII coding is a perfect example. And these bits have no inherent meaning. In fact, if I change one of the bits in ASCII code, I get something completely different. Uh, it's the whole thing has to be looked at at once in a kind of arbitrary assignment. So, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as we all use the same convention. In the brain and in HTM theory, we use sparse distributed representations. This, you have to have at least several thousand bits to do something uh, useful. Now, when I say a bit, you can think about it as a neuron. It's a neuron's either active or it's not. And uh, they're sparse because at any point in the brain, a time in the brain, you'll find very few of the synapses being, I mean, very few of the neurons being active. Most of the time, there's only 1 or 2% that are active, and most, and, uh, most of the time, um, the rest are relatively inactive. So when I talk about zeros and ones, you could think neurons, OK, active or inactive. So you have many thousands of bits, and they're sparse because we have a very small percentage of them are 1. The example I'll use here is 2,000 bits, 2% uh, active, so I'd have 41s and 1,960 zeros. Now, it's important to understand that the bits mean something. This meaning is learned, but we can think about it. They have semantic meaning. So if I was going to represent a letter, I might have a bit that represents, um, um, uh, you know, is, is it a, a, a consonant or, or um, a, a vowel, or how is it sound, or how is it drawn, does it have ascenders, descenders, things like this, attributes of it. And I'd pick the top 40 attributes that match this letter. We don't do that. Um, it has to be learned, but that's the basic idea. OK, so what are the properties of this? First, a very simple property is similarity. If I have two sparse distributed representations, and uh, they both have 2% of their bits active. If they, was, if they share a bit, meaning if they share a cell, if, if it was in the brain being active, then they're sharing some semantic meaning. And this does not happen by chance. It's very, very, it, because these are sparse, you will not do this by chance. Even random SDRs have very little overlap. So if they overlap even just a few bits, bits it means they're semantically similar. Um, the next thing you want to do, we're building a memory system. The brain is a memory system. So the first thing you have to think about is like, how do I store a pattern? And how do I remember it? And how do I recognize it when it occurs again? So imagine I got these thousands of cells or thousands of bits. The way we want to store a pattern is not remembering the whole pattern. We only have to remember the locations of the one bits. Uh, if I can just remember where the, the one bits are, and I can see a new pattern come in and say, well, does it match those? If it does, I'm good. I don't have to look at all the other ones. So in this case, I might have indexed to 41 bits. But what if I couldn't do that? What if I could only store the location of 10? There's some subset. Um, and I said, you're not allowed to store the location of all the one bits. All the cells are active. Just a small subsample of them. Well, what's going to happen? A new pattern can come in, and I might match those 10, but the others I don't know about. You say, well, I could make an error. Uh, statistically, it's extremely unlikely for this to occur. And if you do make an error, you're making an error for something that's semantically quite similar to the thing you stored. 
And this is the key to how the brain generalizes. Uh, it, 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 it does this. Now, if you haven't made the connection yet, I'll make it for you. When a cell wants to recognize a large pattern, it only has to form a small number of synapses to other cells nearby that are active. So it might be hundreds or thousands of cells nearby that are active, but as long as it's sparse activation, an individual cell only has to make connection to maybe 10 or 15 of those to know that the entire pattern is there. And this is what's going on on dendrites on in neurons. There's another property, and this is the last one I'm going to get into, but it's also very, very important to the theory, is that you can form a union of sparse distributed representations. So I, let's say I took 10 of them, and I just ordered them together. And I now I have a new one, which is the same number of bits, but it's got more one bits. It's got about 20%, a little bit less maybe. I can't undo this. I can't say, oh, what was the original 10? I can't do that. But I can ask, is this new pattern one of the original 10? And I'm going to claim that if I say, well, if the new pattern ones are in the same location as the unions ones, I'm going to have a match. And you could think, well, I could make a mistake there. I could be mixing matching from different of these patterns that I've stored earlier, the union. Again, extremely unlikely for that to happen. Um, the math shows it's almost astronomically unlikely to happen. Um, but again, if you do, you're making a mistake with one of the things that are semantically similar to ones you had before. This property is used throughout the cortex, and in Supertai's talk, he's going to talk about that. Uh, where is this? I'll give you one example where it's used. Imagine now I'm looking at a neuron, and I'm looking at all the synapses that are near the neuron. There's several hundred of them. And um, let's say I store up 10 synapses for every pattern I want to recognize. And I just throw those synapses all together. So I have now several hundred synapses representing dozens and dozens of patterns. Well, that cell will be able to uniquely identify any one of those patterns without getting confused. And so we actually believe that we have a sort of different model of a neuron than most people think about it. We think that the neuron in our models, the, the feed-forward connections, the proximal synapses, can, can, can activate the cell from dozens of feed-forward patterns. The cell can actually respond to many different patterns in a feed-forward case. It's not just one thing it's recognizing. And it can respond to hundreds on the, on the more distal dendrites. That is, it can recognize, it can predict its own activity in hundreds of contexts that are unique and very precise. All right, so let's put this all together. Um, uh, in, in how we get this to work. How am I going to build a layer of cells that learns, builds a predictive model, and we're going to use that to build our cortex? Here is a bunch of neurons in, our, in one of our simulations. Um, this is just a single layer of cells, and each of these cells is receiving some input on its proximal synapses, and some of them get more, better input than others, and so that's the color here it designates which ones are more strongly activated than which ones aren't. And then the ones that are more strongly active act fire first, and they inhibit their neighbors. And so you end up with a sparse representation. This is a picture of uh, a very few number of cells, but it's about 2% sparsity. So we're just showing you a little subset. And, um, and so this is what you might have. And a moment later, you would have, this is maybe one time, a moment later, you have a different pattern. And so this kind of thing goes back and forth all the time. This is what's going on in your brain right now. It's, as I'm speaking, you're having patterns like this, sparse patterns changing. And that is the sequence we want to learn. It's these transitions we want to learn. How are we going to do that? Well, when a cell becomes active, all it needs to do is to look for cells nearby that were active a moment ago. And, and it forms connections to them on one of its dendrites. And now it'll say, look, there's a huge pattern going on out there, but I've just connected, connected to 10 of those cells. And if I see those 10 cells going again, I'm going to predict that I'm going to become active next, because that's what I just learned. I became active when those cells were active. So all the cells are doing this all the time. What will happen is if you train it for a little bit and then you show it a, a new pattern, in this case the red cells are the input pattern, a whole bunch of cells will be saying, oh, I'm going to be next, I'm going to be next too, I'm predicting. And the reason you have here we have more cells predicting than, we, uh, than the more yellow cells than red cells is that we've, we trained this on three transitions, A to B, A to C, and A to D. So if I show it A, it predicts B, C, and D, the union of these three. And that's what the yellow cells represent, the union of three patterns. Now, this is the beginning of sequence memory. It says, oh, I can give an input. I can predict what's going to happen next. I can make a union of predictions, so I don't have to have a precise prediction. But I'll know if any one of those three occurred. And I'll know precisely if they occurred. Now, this is what we call a first order sequence memory. It is not able to solve the problem I proposed earlier of ABCD versus XBCY. And we need to solve that problem. We need to be able to say, you know what, what I predict next is, is dependent on something that happened a long time ago, not just something happened a second ago or a, a half a second ago. 
So the way we're going to solve this is we're going to use these mini columns. And uh, I'm going to walk you through that. And this is about as deep as the, com the, the top talk goes, and it will get back and get easier again. Um, so now we're looking at a slice of the cortex. I'm showing just a, a series of little mini columns there. And this is a cartoon drawing. And there's six cells per each one of those mini columns. And in this case, I'm showing three, when you have a feed forward input, what we believe is going on is it actually activates the mini columns. Um, the, each one of these. And so it's a sparse representation of mini columns. So I've shown three being activated. Now, if nothing else had occurred and there was no prediction, what will happen is all the cells in those columns will become active. This is a, an unexpected input. And an unexpected input, no prediction, um, I'm going to activate all these cells. It's sort of like, I don't know what's going on. The alternate scenario is if some of those cells were in a predicted state, shown here in yellow, um, and the same columnar activation occurs, those cells will fire first and inhibit everyone else, and I get a very sparse representation. The same columns, but now it's a sparse set of cells. This is a very unique um, representation for this particular transition. If I, I'll walk you through an example here for the ABCD and XBCY. So here I'm going to show you in this sort of cartoon drawing, here's our sequence, A, B, C, D. Notice I've shown three columns active in each of those representations. This is before training. There's no expectation, so all the cells fire. Here's the, here's the sequence for X, B, C, Y. Notice X is different than A, different set of columns, but the B columns and the C columns are identical. And of course, then I have a different, set, a different for Y and D at the other end. Now, after training, what occurs, oops, there's a little missing dots there. I'm not sure why. The A is still the same uh, as before. And um, you can ignore those missing dots there. I don't, they, they weren't in my presentation. They were just somehow. I don't know. Um, what happens here is that we now get something called B prime. Since it was predicted, it had learned this. And so it's the same columns, but now individual cells in those columns. Similarly, I have something called the C prime representation. Same columns as C, but individual cells in C. So C prime is basically says this is what occurs after B prime. And B prime occurs after A. And so when I get to D, I can predict D in the column space, but I have a unique representation for D. This is D in the context of ABC. And I can do the same thing for X, B, C, Y, and you'll end up with a different representation for B, B double prime and C double prime and Y double prime. And this is basically how you learn high order sequences, how you learn speeches and music and so on. The capacity of the system is amazing. Um, if I have to just take an example, if I had 40 active columns, a very small number of columns, and I have 10 cells per column, then there are 10 to the 40th ways to represent the same input in different contexts. There's 10 to the 40th ways to say this in this context is unique from this in another context. And it's, it, when you start thinking about it, you realize your life is full of this. This is what you're doing all the time. This is a beautiful mechanism that works extremely well. We put all this together, and we can make this whole thing work. I'm not going to go through all the details. We end up what we call the HTM temporal memory. It's a, it's a sequence memory. It's equivalent to like a cellular layer. Um, it converts an into to a sparse activation in columns, and it builds a temporal model. And it has some really nice attributes. One, it learns continuously. That is, there's no batch training here. Every new input, it's constantly adjusting its synaptic weights, and it's constantly learning. It can extend sequences and forget them, and so on. It's very high capacity. Even a very small section of this can learn millions of transitions. It uses local learning rules, which is important when we get to harder implementations. But there's no global supervisor going on here. It's naturally fault tolerant. Every single component of this is, 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 can fail, and, and every any individual component can fail, and nothing bad will happen. It has no sensitive parameters, and it semantically generalizes. These are all really desirable features uh, in a memory system. Okay, and we believe this is a building block uh, for both the cortex and for machine intelligence. So essentially, I can do a variation of this sequence memory in each of the layers, and if I can build a, a region of cortex, then I can take build a, put that in a hierarchy, and I'm on my way to building a, a neocortical system. Uh, let me just switch now to the research roadmap uh, to give a sense of what we've done and where we're going. Um, so here's our little map of the four layers again. You should recognize them by now, hopefully. Right? We have spent most of our time um, working on what we consider layer two, three. It is the high order inference, the high order sequence memory. Um, this was the right place for us to start, in some sense the simplest one, the one that we could characterize easiest. Um, I'm going to give you a little, uh, I say theory 98%. What does that mean? This is a very subjective number. It's how I feel about it. 
Okay, that's a, it's just intuition about how much we understand about what's going on here. Uh, but I think it would be useful for you to, to share that with you. So I think we have a pretty good handle on this. There's a few tidy ends we, we may have to tweak and clean up and so on. This has been extensively tested over years. We put it into commercial products. We know this works really well in commercial settings. Um, this is not just some you know, ideas on paper. We have taken that, well, so I'll go on to the next thing. The next, we've been working on layer uh, four. Uh, here, I'm pretty confident we have the basic idea of what's going on. You take that same sequence memory and you feed in motor commands and it builds a predictive sensory motor predictive model. Um, and uh, there's a lot we don't know yet, but I, we're over the hump on this one as far as I'm concerned. And it's currently in development. We're, we're working on this right now. Uh, we haven't built anything commercial with it yet, but we're, we're testing it and working it through it slowly. Um, the motor sequences. This is where things really get interesting because you start adding behavior and robotics to the system. Uh, I think we understand about half of what's going on there. I think we have some really good foundation principles. We haven't started um, implementing any of it yet. Uh, so but we think about it a lot because <clears throat> all, all these things are interplaying all the time. And then finally on the layer six, we haven't really spent much time at all. I have some key components that I know have to be in there. I give it about a 10%, maybe it's 20% understanding of it. So that's where we are in, in terms of how we think about our research. Now, since we did layer two, three, and we did this high order uh, inference engine, we then turned it into a technology and we've used it. So you can think about what can I do with this? Well, the data it works with is streaming data. It has to be ch data that changes over time because there's no behavioral component in this. It's relying on data coming in like music um, to come in or speech or data streams off of machines, things like that, streaming data. What you can do with it is we can model that data, we can make predictions, we can detect anomalies, and we can cl do classifications. We've shown that we can do very good jobs at all this on streaming data. The applications uh, are varied, I'll just mention a few in a moment, but basically you can do predictive maintenance, uh, security, natural language processing, anything that has streaming data. <clears throat> These are, uh, the way we've done this is we've taken, we've built a simple system, you take some data stream, you have to run it through an encoder, the encoder turns that data into a sparse representation. So we have encoders for numbers and categories and dates and times, working with a company called Cortical IO. We have an encoder for uh, words. We have an encoder for GPS coordinates. We've done a bunch of these. Once you've got them into SDRs, you can throw them into a high order sequence memory and out comes predictions and anomalies. We've applied it to a number of problems. Uh, we have a commercial product called Grok, which basically detects anomalies in servers and server-based applications on AWS. We've applied to the same basic idea to human behavior. So can we detect when a human starts acting unusual? Maybe a rogue trader uh, who starts behaving differently. We can do that. We can detect when people start using their computers differently in a, in a very significant way. We actually think we, can, we, we've, we know we can detect anomalies in stock uh, volumes. Uh, we've done some cool work in geospatial anomalies. We can detect when things get off track or change the direction or change at different speeds and so on. And then working with this company, Cortical IO, um, we've shown that you can do a natural language processing. And it's very cool. And you should see the demos for Cortical IO later today. And I think Chayton's going to talk about it too. I'm not going to go further into these at the moment. I just want to say that we've, that's what we've done with layer three. And by the way, all of these use the exact same code base. This is not a, we don't even, have to tweak it. It's the exact same code base, and we're getting close to that universal algorithm. Um, so you can t as long as you get the data into a sparse representation, you're good. OK, so that's what we've done mostly. Now, what could I do with the sensory motor inference, the stuff we're working on right now? Well, what would it be good for? Well, first of all, it's, it's good for working with static data. And, um, but it needs some sort of simple behavior. So, for example, we could look at a picture, which is static data, but I, to train the system, I have to move the eyes over it. And I can do it in a fairly stupid way and still get good results. So um, it's sort of static data, but you need with some sort of simple behaviors. Uh, you can do classification, and you can do prediction in this case. Uh, the example we're going to work on, the one we're working on, is vision. It's a, it's a classic example. Everyone wants to, to work on that. Um, how do you, is you understand what an image is? And our approach is, is you have to train the system. It has to saccade and has to learn in a hierarchy how to make a predictive model of motor, of motor behaviors and what's going to happen. We think we understand how that's all going to work. Um, there are other things you can do with it very cool. You could do, for example, uh, classify network. Any structure that's out there. I could have a, a set of uh, some sort of very complex computer network, and I want to classify it. It could be n-dimensionally complex, but I want to classify and say, well, what's it like and what is it similar to? Uh, I think this technology would work for that. So some clever, I think some very clever applications are going to come out of this. 
Finally, of course, if you go to adding in motor behavior, um, then things really get interesting. It doesn't matter. You can have static or streaming data, but the capability you're going to get now is not just simple behavior, but goal-oriented behavior, where the cortex itself starts saying, this is the behavior I want to achieve a particular result, a particular uh, predicted result, and how do I get there? And this is when we're going to be able to enter into robotics. Now, when I think of robotics, it could be physical robots, um, but mostly I think about things that are not physical robots. I think about things that are like smart bots, things that are scouring the web trying to figure out how, where bad guys are and things like that, or proactive defense. Anywhere you have some sort of system where the, the intelligent machine is navigating intelligently through some sort of structure, uh, and it's trying to achieve certain results. That's going to really where the whole thing opens up. And I'll, I'll mention briefly the layer six thing. It's not in the same category. Essentially, this is necessary for hierarchy, and uh, it's going to be really necessary for building very large multi-sensory, multi-behavioral multi modalities. Um, but the other three are really the key things here. So that's our research roadmap. It gives you a sense of where we're going. You might be saying, well, how long is this going to take? I don't know. Um, we did, we did, it took us a long time to really figure out what's going on the, the, the top part there, the layer three. But now it's a lot quicker. We were able to do the layer four stuff and figure that out much faster. And uh, I think it's accelerating. So um, I don't know how long this is all going to take to play out. But uh, I certainly hope to be part of it. And I'm working at it. OK. Um, another part of our research roadmap is essentially our approach to doing research. Uh, and we're very open and transparent. And um, so uh, as you probably know, all of our algorithms are documented. Uh, people have created multiple independent implementations of them. Our software is open source under GPL version 3 license. We have a new uh, um, open source project. You can find it at Nementa.org. Tomorrow and Sunday, we're having a hackathon down in San Jose. Uh, there's active discussion groups for theory and implementation. Uh, we have now started posting our, our research code, I mean, really messy stuff like here's what we played with today, we're up there because some people wanted to see it, and including some people in this audience. So we're being very, very transparent. We're also open to lots of collaborations. We have a, a long going collaboration with IBM Research in San Jose. This is a group you probably haven't heard about, uh, but they're interested in doing hardware implementations of these algorithms. There's a similar relationship with a DARPA in Washington, D.C. There's a program called the Cortical Processor, which is also based around HTM principles. And we work with other small companies. I mentioned Cortical I.O., they're doing the natural language processing. And you're welcome to contact me and Nementa, and we're, we're all very open and available to talk about this stuff. Okay. I want to give you my little flavor, and this is my last slide, um, of uh, sort of the big roadmap here, well, I mean, well, the big picture of what's going on. So we got, there's a lot of confusion in this space about all these different approaches, and, and I, I may not be able to clear up that confusion, but at least I'll share how, we, how I think about this. The, I see there's sort of three basic p approaches to building intelligent machines. On the left is the people like ourselves who say you need to model the cortex. These are cortical modelers. So, all right, we got a brain, it's smart, let's figure out what it does, let's model it. Uh, I use HTM as uh, an example because I think it's one of the best and the most advanced theories in this space. On the, then there's the sort of the artificial neural network world. Uh, the current favorite right there today is deep learning. And uh, that's getting a lot of press and a lot of success. And then you have the more classic AI and uh, lots of different things in, on the, all these categories. But I'll, I'll use Watson because that's, that's been in the news recently and uh, I, IBM's pushing it very heavily. OK, so they're basically built on different premises. One premise on the cortical modeling is that biology matters. And we focus on biology. We use the biology as a set of constraints. We don't think it's a nice guideline. It's, it bet, this is the real McCoy. I need to understand how the biology works. And once I understand it, I can deviate from it. But I don't just, we don't make up stuff willy nilly and say, well, I think it might work like this. Just try that. Now, we constantly go back to the neuroscience. We constantly go back to the biology and say, this, no, it can't work that way. It has to be something like this. That's what drives us. The artificial neural networks are really mathematically driven. They're not biologically driven at all. Uh, despite the fact that they're called neural networks and some people say they're brain like, they're not. The neurons they use are totally unlike real neurons. The networks they use are unlike real networks. The training paradigms they use are unlike biological training paradigms. But what they do have is they have a mathematical foundation. They can prove that these algorithms, these networks, will converge or they'll, they'll produce the right result. And that's a very powerful thing. Sometimes people, I've been told over and over again from some of the people in this camp, like, well, you can't understand if HTMs work because you don't have a mathematical foundation for it. And you just won't know if it works. I said, well, I can see why it's going to work. And I build it, and it does work. And they said, that's not good enough. I said, well, I don't know. But you know, I say, we build computers, and there's no formula to represent how a computer works. And we seem to be happy with those. Um, 
So, and then of course in the AI world, it's basically an engineered solution. We say, okay, let's, we have a problem, let's engineer a solution for that. The data they work on is a little bit different. Uh, we work with spatial temple data right from the get-go. We knew, we knew that brains are all about temple data, spatial temple data, and we're starting to add simple behaviors into it. So I've, I've given us credit for that one. The artificial neural networks are primarily spatial problems. Um, deep learning networks are primarily spatial classifiers, and they realize they have to add the temple component, and a lot of the researchers there are talking about it and working on it, they haven't quite gotten it right yet, so I'm gonna give them partial credit for that because they're moving in that direction, which is good. And in the case of Watson in the AI world, the data they work with are language and documents, it's something very high level, totally very different. The capabilities are a little bit different too. Um, the cortical models are basically predictive models, and we can do classification, and we're starting to think about how to do goal-oriented behavior. Today, artificial neural networks like deep learning are really just classification networks. Um, and they're really good at it, but they're classification networks. And then, of course, if they watch it, it's more like natural language querying. Now, all of these things are valuable. I'm not trying to put a value judgment on them. They all solve problems. They're all very useful. Um, this is not saying one's better than the other. They're just different approaches. But what I do think is, 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 is true, and, I, and my next point here is, are they on the path to true machine intelligence? Are they on the path to what we all think about of intelligent machines? And in that case, I argue that the cortical modelers are the only ones who are on that path. We are definitely there. I've laid out a path here. I've talked about the components. I've talked about how all this stuff fits together and a theory about how the cortex works and behavior. We have a roadmap, even if we don't understand it all, we know where we're going. Uh, the AI world, no, they're not. And I don't make that up. The guys who created Watson said so themselves. They said, this is not an intelligent machine. It's not gonna lead to an intelligent machine, but it's really cool for what it does and good for them. Um, and I'm gonna argue in the artificial neural network world, they're probably not on a path to a machine intelligence. If they want to, and if it's gonna get there, they have to add time, they have to have behavior, they have to add sort of these broader concepts, SDRs, things like that, that, that I talked about. And my hope is that these worlds converge. Um, but I do think that the way to get there, and from my belief, is to start with the cortical models. So that's my view of where we are and where we're going. Uh, I'll just end with a few comments, um, and then we can do some questions. Um, I, I think we're at a pivotal time in humanity. This is a really, really interesting time to live. Uh, we are at a time where we are actually figuring out how the brain works. And there's nothing in my mind that can be more interesting than that. I mean, we are a species is defined by our brain. That's really the only thing that makes us unique. We're not really good at anything else. And, and, and so, and everything we do that's interesting, our knowledge, our language, our arts, it's all product of brains, and knowledge is, is only can be understood by brains, and the scientific process is the process the brain uses. I mean, so to understand humanity, we have to understand brains. And the idea that we can now build machines that work on those same principles to help us discover things faster and bigger and, and, and apply to problems that we were not very good at is tremendously exciting to me. This is not about building robots or you know, machines that are gonna take over the world, nothing like that at all. It's about building machines that are useful to us that learn and learn to um, build models of the world and interact with the world in ways that we can't do. And I, I have no idea what these future applications are gonna be. It's really impossible. But I know they're gonna be amazingly cool. And, uh, and I think this is gonna be driving uh, technology development for the next 100 years. Um, and we're, we have a chance, at least the opportunity, to participate that uh, now. And uh, at times it seems very hard and difficult to do, but I think we're making really great progress. So again, thank you for coming here. I appreciate your time.